Hey, you random stranger. It's Hippie K episodes nine and 10 today, but I am equally looking forward to pulling together all of the comments from last time and continuing that conversation about what's happening in the story at a deeper level. And you guys know that I normally love doing that anyway, but the last episodes in particular hit on some complicated character moments that one, are difficult to interpret in a straightforward manner and really threw us into the deep end of very complex, ambiguous human emotion, and two, uh, touched on some real-world issues that exist outside of Hibike, but that inevitably colour how we interpret what's going on with our characters, which is why after the last reaction, which has been a while now, uh, I was hoping that people who saw things differently to me would comment so that I could broaden my perspective of what characters like Shuichi and Asuka and Kumiko and Reina are thinking and how they see each other. And uh, we definitely got a range of views in the comments, uh, which I'm very grateful for. So thank you so much for that, uh, because they really helped me refine my initial reaction to certain things. We may not end up agreeing, but that is the beauty of discussion. You know, we can be respectfully aware of different perspectives and weigh them against both in-text cues and also uh, sources that are external to the text. And actually, this time I broke a long-standing principle of mine to not look up things outside of the show, but I went and I read excerpts of an interview that Naoko Yamada, uh, the series director, and Tatsuya Ishihara, the director-director, did because I was dying to find out what the creators were going for, especially in the Kumiko and Reina scenes. And, you know, sure enough, I got most of the answers that I suspected, but would never have been able to confirm if I hadn't looked outside. Um, Having said that, though, uh, there is definitely room for multiple interpretations of the events and the dialogue in these episodes. And I may come down on a particular reading because logically to me, it seems the most reasonable one based on the available clues or cues, but that does not make it the only reasonable reading. Um, I may also joke about like going after you with an axe if you ever say anything against a character that I love, but please know, um, especially if you've watched shows with me for a while now, that I'm just joking. Uh, Like I said last time, it's important to acknowledge that uh, the way that we respond to characters and their actions is significantly influenced by our own personal uh, knowledge and experiences, which is why it is so critical to listen to different viewpoints. Like sometimes that is the only way that we humans ever get outside of ourselves and just level up in our understanding. Um, It's also why I always come away with uh, something new and valuable from reading Uh, the comments that you guys send in, um, even if I don't end up changing my core view of things. If you're still here listening to this incredibly long-winded introduction, I'm sorry for beating around the bush like this before we even get to the actual meat of the episodes, but I felt I needed to lay that groundwork down for the discussion we're about to have on episode seven and eight, because they were probably the episodes with the widest divergence of opinions on almost every character. So how I'm going to do it today is uh, discuss individual characters in order of analytical difficulty to me, like from my perspective. So I'll start with a character I found most easy to understand, which doesn't mean at all that they are simpler characters. It's just that their motivations weren't as shrouded in potential controversy. Uh, So the order will be Aoi first, then Haruka, Asuka, Shuichi, and then finally, you know, Reina and Kumiko will just come in one messy, fascinating package. Again, if you end up vehemently disagreeing with me, I think that's awesome. Uh, 
I will do my best to present a coherent case as to why I think the way that I do, uh, all the while being sensitive to the fact that my being like a queer pan girl, extreme introvert, and also like a former high school high achiever who really, really pushed myself to succeed and as a result, distance myself from people kind of like Asuka and Reina, both of whom I relate to quite a bit, oddly enough, uh, that those experiences will inevitably bleed into my analysis for better or for worse. Before diving into the serious stuff, uh, I was having a conversation with a couple of wind and brass players uh, on Discord, and I don't know if they watch this, but they know who they are. Uh, And I learned about the spit or the condensation that collects in brass instruments, which often then ends up on the floor to the point where you have to, when you pack up, kind of clean it off the ground, these puddles, which I find absolutely disgusting and (laughs) am so grateful that you had never had to deal with that in string orchestras. But I am glad to have learned that little piece of insight and knowledge because I felt I was praising brass and woodwind instruments a little bit too much last time. So now I've got like the perfect ammo to back up my extremely biased view that string instruments are superior. Right, let's start with our saxophones. Uh, For episode seven, I'd assumed that crybaby saxophone referred to Haruka, who uh, plays the barry sax and had that tearful breakdown in front of both Kumiko and Asuka, but I think it could have just as well applied to Aoi uh, tenor sax, who, though she was more contained in her sadness, also had moments where her facade broke. And I'm 100% sure that Aoi also had, like, you know, moments, you know, agonizing moments and had maybe even cried over, you know, the decision that she had to make. And on rewatch, I was struck again by how seamlessly that scene with Aoi leaving the band mid-rehearsal really abruptly triggered Haruka's immediate confession to her own insecurities and feelings of helplessness, which then led to her exploding in front of Asuka, which then became a springboard to dig into the tension that's been bubbling between the two of them. This question of why is Haruka president and not Asuka? And I thought it was just a brilliant piece of writing and sequencing of events. It felt like watching the domino effect, except instead of dominoes, it was these characters deeply held um, insecurities and emotions and fraught relationships just collapsing one onto the other. So while everyone is uh, done with exams and starting to really get serious about the upcoming prefectural competition, Aoi is still doing that thing where she leaves rehearsal early to go to crime school. And Kumiko notices, and I loved how in the first few minutes of episode seven, the camera moved in a way that mimicked Kumiko's perspective. Uh, The quitting itself happened to everyone's surprise, including Aoi herself, I think. The way that Taki singled Aoi out for that bum note that she was playing, uh, it's actually completely normal for band practice, you know, because one person playing a bad note drags the rest of the band down. But the spotlight ended up hitting a nerve because it revealed the impossibility of Aoi keeping up with both her very busy study schedule and her music practice. So forced to make a choice, Aoi walks out and I felt so bad for her, but it really came down to that harsh truth that if you have one foot on two separate boats, you end up falling into the water when those boats diverge she'd already failed to get into the high school of her choice and so she couldn't afford anything else distracting her from getting to the college that she wants. The whole scene was super dramatic. Uh, Haruka was barely keeping it together. Kumiko ran after Oi and and Taki interestingly kind of lets it all unfold without saying too much but later when he's looking at Aoi's uh, resignation letter so to speak 
you can tell that the incident really weighs heavily on his mind. Um, The nuance that was intriguing about Aoi's decision, though, is that it wasn't just about her freeing up more time to study. It was also related to the guilt that Aoi felt for not having prevented the first years from quitting the previous year, which is a guilt that she shares with some other current third years, namely Haruka and Kaori. I really appreciated this shot of Haruka overtaking Kumiko when chasing after Aoi. Um, I took it as hinting that, yes, it's understandable, Kumiko is upset watching a friend quit band like that under those kind of traumatic circumstances. But Haruka arguably carries much heavier emotional baggage when it comes to Aoi quitting. They went through the split together and carried the burden of failing to prevent it together. Um, And so Haruka is desperate. You know, she tells Aoi that she doesn't have to participate in the competition if she doesn't want to and if it's too much for her, as long as she stays in the band. But even when Haruka was saying that, you could tell that they both knew it wasn't possible. You know, not with this new version of the band who are united behind the goal of winning an actual legitimate gold. And I always said as much when she replied, I can't go that far. So, you know, say what you will about Aoi, but I thought it was both very brave and wise of her to know her limits, to admit where her abilities can and can't take her, given a set of specific goals and time constraints. Um, But then she went on to say, like, last year I couldn't stop them, the first years, from quitting, so I can't. Uh, wander my way to nationals, meaning that she can't not do her best when last year she was encouraging people to not give up on the band. So if like Haruka was suggesting she chose to stay but continued not doing her best, it would be um, hypocritical almost. Uh, Alternatively, you know, everything she did was for the good of the band. So last year it was trying to prevent the split. This year, it means quitting so that she doesn't drag everyone down because she can't practice as much as she needs to. And this is so real to any kind of team-based activity, Uh, specifically in band. If there is one person in a 50 to 60 person band who plays one note out of tune or out of time, you can like immediately pick who they are and it can take people out of the musical experience for that one moment. It can also cost you a placing in a competition. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's very exacting. And in classic Kiwani style, you know, the writers managed to weave so much more nuance into why Aoi quit. Yes, the choice was motivated by her need to prioritize study, but beneath that was also Aoi realizing that she wouldn't be able to face the rest of her band if she kept trying and failing to make both ends meet. She's like uh, the epitome of that Aesop's fable about the dog and its reflection, that if you're too greedy, you end up losing everything. Except in this case, Aoi was kind of smart and chose to go with just one thing. With all that pent up guilt and inability to achieve everything, it's no wonder that Aoi always had that kind of like sad look on her face all the time. She did half smile when she met up with Haruka later on uh, and kind of jokes about how maybe she never liked band in the first place anyway. But that just made me feel even sadder for her, to be honest, because it came off as something you'd say to make the pain of the choice that you had to make a little bit easier to swallow. Also, sometimes, um, and I don't recommend this as a permanent solution by any means, but if you tell these lies to yourself often enough, they can come true in a way, like maybe. Like sometimes you just have to tell yourself what you need to believe in order to get through this rough patch and then just let time do the rest of the healing. So that's Aoi, um, and now Haruka. So 
at the start when the band is tuning and they're not really in tune, Haruka said, like, use your ears, listen to those around you, make sure you don't lose them. Which turns out to be a hugely ironic line because Haruka had to learn that sometimes losing someone is not within your control. Like, it's not up to you if they go or not. She did her best to get Aoi to stay. She failed at that and then blamed herself, even though it wasn't her fault. Um, Just like she blamed herself for not being the kind of president that the band needs, when in fact she was exactly the kind of person the band needed to survive. And in terms of uh, the choice between her and Asuka as president, Haruka was clearly more suited to that role by virtue of her even being willing to take it. Okay, so let's just go back to the sequence of events again. So Haruka finished pleading with Aoi. Aoi physically walks out of the shot, uh, making her exit final. And then the very next thing we hear is Haruka blurting out, I was never cut out to be the president. Not, I'm not cut out to be president. So instead of using like present simple tense, she used uh, present perfect tense, implying that Aoi quitting was just yet another black mark that Haruka is adding to her record, suggesting that there are other things she feels bad about and has felt bad about for this whole time and that in her mind disqualify her as being a good president. And that's what I love about Hibike's dialogue. It suggests events that we're not yet aware of. You can mine the dialogue for more meaning by tracing what's not being said and why characters are responding the way that they are. It's then confirmed that Haruka has been plagued by this idea that everyone in the band thinks Asuka should have been president. And for her to have held all of these feelings of inadequacy at bay while still leading the band and ensuring it survives... I think speaks volumes of Haruka's strength. Uh, When she kind of let flies at Kumiko, it came across as an incredibly rare moment of breakdown for Haruka. It's not something she does often, if ever. Unfortunately for Kumiko, she puts her foot in her mouth by trying to reassure Haruka of her qualities as a president, but all she can come up with is, you're nice. Words, man, that just cut so deep because Haruka takes it to mean apparently that she has nothing else going for her. None of the other qualities that make good leaders like um, charisma or strong decision making abilities or conflict management skills. And part of why Kumiko can't think of anything else is because she wasn't there when the split happened and didn't get to witness how badass Haruka had to be to save the situation. I'm going to compliment the flow of shots here again. Uh, That sequence when Kumiko apologizes to Haruka and then Haruka sort of like stepping back with a look of shock that says, oh shit, I didn't mean to go off at you. And then Asuka stepping in to save the baby with her shtick of, well, don't involve the kid in a fight between parents. That was all somehow beautifully captured in a matter of seconds. Um, And we'll dig deeper into Asuka's character later, uh, but in this moment, I was just appreciating her dominant, like, alpha stance with her hands on her hips and that coy smile that she put on for this very tense situation. And I think you could take that in either a good or a bad way, because it could be good because she obviously wanted to diffuse the situation with her signature humor or flippancy particularly as she was trying to let Kumiko off the hook. You know, a junior who has little idea of the dynamics that are churning beneath the surface. But it could also be seen as Asuka being quite insensitive to Haruka's very volatile emotional state, Uh, especially when she joked about Haruka, you know, constricting her kohai like a snake and just bluntly telling her to go deal with her emotional instability. Um, So... I may love Asuka as a character, but she is far from perfect. And what what made me feel a bit better, though, about the way that Asuka handled this at first with humor is that she and Haruka are 
tight. You know, they know each other so well and there is a strong relationship of trust between the two of them. Had Haruka and Asuka not had that kind of relationship, Asuka's approach definitely would have come off as super inappropriate and super insensitive. I greatly enjoyed the two moments of split second surprise on Asuka's face that we get. First, when Haruka kind of like snatched the handkerchief that Asuka offered her, but Asuka instantly recovered from that. The second moment, though, lasted much longer when Haruka yelled at Asuka for her to go be president. Um, And contrasting Asuka's coolness before that outburst really enhanced the surprise on her face. And it showed that even Asuka can be taken aback, particularly when faced with Haruka in this state. And that is when Asuka dispenses with the humor and flips immediately to being ruthlessly direct. She becomes almost like a mirror for Haruka's deepest unspoken thoughts. And she says, you know, without flourish and with a brutal, brutal honesty, you could have refused to become president too, right? (laughs) And... Oh God, like the little visual details here and the way that Minako Kotobuki, who is the love of my life, you know, voice actor wise, said that line was chilling. The reflection in Asuka's glasses um, covers her gaze for a second before she spits the truth and her eye is suddenly revealed, sort of mirroring the way in which she very suddenly shed the humor and opted to tell Haruka the harsh truth that they both already knew. It also revealed that beneath Asuka's very joking character or exterior, she also has a depth to her that we've really, to this point, or until this point, not seen much of. Her line, you could have refused to, was also said in an audibly sad way like she regrets having to remind Haruka of the truth that she did have a choice but it wasn't said in a way that was like oh you could have chosen not to be captain but you did so you can't blame anyone for the predicament that you find yourself in it wasn't like that it was more um you could have chosen not to be captain but you did and I understand why you did and I'm sad because it's something I didn't want to do or could never have done. And because of that, and because of who you are, it fell on you to take up the position of captain. And this was one of those moments, man, where you could just get so much more out of the dialogue on rewatch, having heard the full story of the split and what Haruka had to do. Asuka, in that one line, you know, expressed that Even though no one can blame her for Haruka's choice, she nonetheless played an indirect part and ultimately benefited from it. The beauty of the complexity of choices shows on Haruka's face too. Um, Her face which says, well shit, I did have a choice and I have no one to blame even though I feel like I should. So she already knew that, but it's another matter entirely to have someone, especially someone who's close to you and was there with you, verbalize it. Um, Out of this struggle, though, we see the friendship and the the individualized support that Haruka gets from both Kaori and Asuka. So... Asuka leads the band when Haruka takes the day off. You know, as VP, she keeps the ball rolling if and when she has to. And meanwhile, Kaori is like 100% best girl material when it comes to helping Haruka work through her insecurities and providing some comfort food in the form of um, some kind of potato. I don't know how it was made, but some potato. Uh... I loved that dramatic moment, like when Kaori saw Haruka walk out of the band practice room with that resigned look on her face. Um, It was done in like this slow motion and with an eerie sound effect, just emphasizing how depressed Haruka was. And then Kaori dumps Yuko immediately, you know, she tells her fangirl to, oh, you know, just go home without me. Kaori is an interesting one. Uh, She also teases Haruka, but not in as caustic a way as Asuka. The moment I kind of fell in love with both Haruka and Kaori was when uh, Kaori said something like, you know, Asuka was smart enough to not become captain. And then Haruka sort of 
takes a moment before suspiciously asking, wait, does that mean I'm the stupid one? (laughs) And the answer is yes, but also it showed incredible courage. Um, And it's Cardi who also points out that at the very least, you know, it's the seniors who know uh, what Haruka did and know that she was the best person to be president. Um, It was Hoffertel also made some great points about what makes Haruka awesome. Uh, So she isn't as talented, popular or pretty as her closest friends Asuka and Kaori. She's shy, anxious and often unsure of herself. But despite all this, she stepped up to a role that must frighten her on a daily basis, which I actually didn't think about before, but you're right. It's terrifying every single day. Um, Managing all sorts of personalities and conflicts. Even crybabies can be leaders, and it doesn't mean that they have to completely change themselves to do so. Haruka is no Asuka, and she doesn't need to be. That was a slam dunk comment. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, And, you know, I just, I really ended up greatly appreciating Haruka a lot more. On uh, Haruka stepping up, I also love the detail of when uh, when Kaori is laying out how the band only exists because Haruka was brave. The shot was focused on the sheet music um, with lots of fortissimo and crescendo symbols on it. So fortissimo is that like double F symbol that means to play very loud and crescendo means to increase your volume. Um, There's also like quite a few accent marks scattered here and there in focus, um, all reinforcing and symbolizing the need to step up, which is exactly what Haruka did. I uh, also appreciated how when Haruka tried to give Taki all the credit for the band's success, that Kaori doesn't let her. (laughs) You know, we know that Kaori's praise in particular of Haruka is true because at heart she's an Asuka fan and yet here she is recognizing that Haruka did something Asuka could never have done and so Haruka is back the next day as president even though she still does feel Aoi's um, absence and we're left with this very satisfying arc that makes clear Haruka's incredible value as president. All right uh, we're gonna talk about Asuka now. <laughs> I noticed like a few people share Shuichi's view of Asuka, either of not liking her or not really understanding her. And I found that interesting and just wanted to explore that more. Um, Also, again, please don't mistake my professing my love for Asuka as equivalent to not seeing her flaws. Obviously, there's also like a lot of Hibike I haven't seen yet. But so far, um, though Asuka is a relatively more difficult character to gauge, I also see parts of myself in her, which has made her slightly easier to understand. Um, She's a bit of a chaotic neutral character. Um, I'm more chaotic good, so I don't really relate to that part. (laughs) Like for instance, she immediately accepted that because college entrance exams are coming up, that Aoi, of course, would prioritize those over band. And unlike Haruka, Asuka didn't feel the need to try and convince Aoi to stay. Uh, Similarly, you know, Asuka didn't or doesn't regret not stopping the first years from quitting or she doesn't care. You know, she's more like it was up to everyone to decide for themselves and there's no point in trying to change people's minds. You know, it is what it is. And I'm a little bit torn on whether that's just utter complacency or viewed in a more positive way, just like a really realistic, pragmatic approach to people. Um, she probably could have helped convince the first and third years or tried to help convince the first and third years to come to terms with each other, particularly because she does have, um, skills of persuasion at her disposal should she choose to utilize them. But she chose not to because she didn't see the point in it or couldn't be bothered. But also you could say that she recognized maybe rightly, at how set people were in their ways and that it would have been wasted effort. I don't know, it's also really hard for us to judge because we didn't see exactly how the split went down. We got a rare glimpse of the kind of captain that Asuka would be when she took over for Haruka for that one day. Uh, She is like the picture of an incredibly competent 
tough, eagle-eyed leader. For example, she was able to zone in on individuals who were lagging or weren't playing like they meant it, namely Kumiko, and she really came down hard on her. Um, And also, like, that's why when Kaori checks in on Haruka, uh, Haruka asked, oh, Asuka told you guys to practice? I think she's partly relieved, you know, because obviously that means the band is, you know, going okay, even though she's not there. But also it hurt a little because it's like, oh, even if I'm not there, the band is fine because they have Asuka. Um, but, you know, ultimately Asuka is only a stopgap solution. Uh, like Howdy pointed out, Asuka didn't just refuse to be president. She thought it through and knew she couldn't do it ever. And so it took Haruka's courage and power of will to pull the band back from the brink of collapse. So what's the deal with Asuka and why do I find her so relatable? Um, Part of it is she's characterized by this hyper focus on her music. You know, she chooses to focus her entire being on achieving musical success, which leaves no room for her to care about band politics or what others think. Um, There's only, you know, 24 hours in a day and only so much life you have to live. And so anything that doesn't contribute to her personal growth as a musician um, or, you know, the growth of her bass section, she has no time for. Uh, And one side effect of this, which I think is admirable, is that Asuka just brims with passion for her music. She knows a lot of music theory and just can't help but share that knowledge with anyone who will listen. So much so that it crowds out every other consideration, including the fact that other people may not feel as strongly about music as she does or may not know how to respond to her exuberance uh like when she's gets super excited sort of explaining the crescent moon dance and the story behind it taki sensei kind of half jokingly says yep that's the kind of abandon and he uses the word shamelessness (laughs) that we want the other fascinating thing about asuka is the way that she uses humor as a sort of a front or armor almost when uh haruka comes back Asuka, you know, expresses relief and says out loud that she's only there to flirt with her instrument. In other words, like, you'd best be sure that her subbing in for Haruka was a strictly one-time thing and that she is definitely, definitely not Captain Material. Uh, Similarly, in the next episode, she jokes about the youth being her only love, and it's a joke, but also it's not. Uh... Asuka is not your typical high schooler. You know, she's a high schooler with a hyper focus on music, which rightly or wrongly translates into a lack of investment in the comings and goings of the band and an indifference to how she comes across to others, which naturally distances herself from them. Like Kumiko says, you know, her eyes are completely elsewhere. Especially uh, in high school, where the predominant goal is to fit in, I can understand like why some people would find Asuka's eccentricity uh, at best enigmatic and at worst kind of off-putting. Uh, and I think Shuichi captured that view well. Uh, Asuka is loud and showy, but she doesn't or never seems to show her true self to people, um, at least not to those she's not close to. Uh, she's intensely demanding and perfectionist when it comes to musical performances, but is casually flippant and indifferent to everything and everyone else. Uh, and those are traits that characterize people with hyperfocus. Um, you know, hyperfocus can be good because it means you can work at things for extended periods of time and are much more likely to achieve something difficult and complex, you know, more than the average person. But it can also negatively impact your relationships because you're not um, present or you don't act or respond to people in the way that society expects you to. 
the reason why I have like a surprising amount of empathy for Asuka is because I was similar to her in some ways in school. Uh, not not the over the top part, but in the sense that I was super focused on achieving certain things, um, more so than most of my peers around me, which created uh, a certain distance from them. For example, like in my earlier years, like thank God I had a teacher who let me do two years worth of schooling in one because she saw how absolutely freaking bored I was in class. And then later, like I ended up taking university courses in my last year of high school when I was like 14, um, going on to 15. And then on top of that, I made sure that I completed my two performance diplomas. So one in piano and one in violin by the time I graduated high school. Um, Not because anyone forced me to, but because I was just immensely curious and ambitious and passionate about learning. Um, And I say this to not make the point that any of it was special. Um, I mean, I certainly was not the most gifted kid at school. Um, And, you know, you read stories about kids who graduate college by the time they're 12. But um, more to relay that either as a byproduct or intentionally, I don't know, to this day, um, that this unusual focus resulted in some distance between me and many of my peers because I, like Asuka, was largely uninterested, um, nor did I have the will to cultivate the kind of normal social presence you're expected to at that age. Um, I instead would just naturally close myself off to people and I suspect that that's what's going on with Asuka too. Having that kind of hyper-focus leads to distance, but also you tend to actively distance yourself from people, um, whatever form that takes. Like for me, it was being a hermit and for Asuka, it seems to be just being really over the top all the time because um, distancing just makes life a bit easier. Uh, Unfortunately, even when you're just a tad different like that, um, it kind of puts a target on your back. Some people, often those who aren't close to you and don't really know the real you, uh, they start making assumptions about you. Like it's just a very human thing to do, especially in high school, you know. For me, like most of it was harmless. You know, you just kind of have to deal with people thinking you're a bit weird or really weird, which is fine. But some of it was mildly irritating (laughs) and a bit invasive. You know, things like, oh, why is she so distant? Does she think she's better than everyone else? What's she going for here? When in all honesty, I really just wanted to be left alone (laughs) to happily pursue my interests. Um, And if distance from people helped me do that, then I chose distance. Um, Also, if you're that weirdo in school right now who loves to learn and can't quite connect to people easily, I would say to you, just keep doing what you love. Um, It gets vastly better after high school. Which is why when Shuichi told Kumiko that he doesn't like Asuka, essentially because he can't figure out which part of her is real and which part of her is just an act, uh, I do get it. But also, I would hope that should anyone come across a person that they don't easily understand, the conclusion would not be to dislike them. And I guess that's why I reacted the way I did. Um, I was kind of a bit disappointed. Like, oh man, I like Shuichi, but he's taken a bit of a normie approach here. Um, I did note that Kumiko says she knows what Shuichi means, but I'd make the point that understanding what he means does not necessarily equal agreeing with him. Uh, Because similarly for me, you know, Shuichi's view is eminently understandable, but it's also emblematic of how if someone falls outside of the expected social norms, they become someone to either dislike or fear or both. Um, And actually, I want to pull up Rain's comment, who 
um, who suggested that Shuichi is making a fairly value neutral statement of just how hard it was for him to read the Hone behind her flamboyant Tatemaye. Uh, so, concepts that Babayas expanded on, which is that Hone is what you feel deepest, but not necessarily what you want to show others, while Tatemaye is the you that you present to others that may not necessarily agree with what you truly feel. Uh, concepts that I find fascinating. Um, so thank you for that discussion. Um, and and align with my understanding of Shuichi as really struggling to get Asuka. Um, in fact, I mean, I would much rather the reading be just that, you know. But so far, no one has told me or let me know that Shuichi's dialogue of disliking Asuka um, not exactly a value neutral statement, uh, that that was grossly mistranslated somehow. So all I can really do is take it at face value. Here's the thing. You may dislike Asuka for other completely legitimate reasons. I mean, that's perfectly fine. Like here, I'm only addressing the reason that Shuichi gave to Kumiko in episode seven for disliking her. Um, there's something else that uh, Coplex brought up that I really appreciated, uh, even though I, you know, didn't end up agreeing fully. So they wrote, you have to remember it's been two months since the first years joined the club. This translates into hours and hours of practice and time spent together with other club members. So I don't think it's really fair to assert that Shuichi doesn't know anything about Asuka and or never interacted with her, which is fair. Like, it's true that we might have never seen them interact on screen, but because of how Asuka's character is and her actual role in the club as the VP, I think it's reasonable to assume that Shuichi had enough time to observe Asuka to form an overall idea about her. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I can definitely agree that Shuichi is an observant guy. You know, he knows a lot of things about the band, partly because he picks up a lot from his senpais in the trombone section. Uh, and from that, you can assume he's like a generally um, affable guy, you know, because you need relationships to be able to stay up to date with all that band goss. However, um, I think it's clear that Shuichi, even now, only has a very surface level relationship with Asuka. Um, when I said he doesn't know anything about Asuka, I meant it in the sense that he doesn't have the relationship you need with someone to really know who they are as a person, let alone make judgments about their character. You know, in fact, he himself said that he has no idea who she really is. Uh, and also, yes, they are in the same band and have rehearsed together for many hours, many times, maybe even had casual chats during those rehearsals, but he isn't a Haruka or a Kaori. And even then, you know, Haruka and Kaori seem to still be blindsided sometimes by what Asuka does. Um, also, you know, just speaking from my experience of being in orchestra for a few years with the same people over those years, it is totally possible to not know someone at all even if you've played music with them for years. Funnily enough, you know, just as Kumiko says Asuka has her eyes elsewhere, another way to say that she's distant from most people, the the shot widens to show that Rain has been sitting there this whole time that they've been talking about Asuka. And I think that was also deliberate uh, because I think Raina and Asuka have more in common than you'd think. Um, arguably, Raina also has her eyes elsewhere and makes no secret of that. Um, and we'll talk more about it later, but she, also with Kumiko, finds it difficult to relate to her peers um, and she actually leans into that. So those three, uh, Asuka, Raina, and Kumiko, they fascinate me in that their personalities in different ways fall very much outside of the standardized norms for like straight high schoolers. Since we've already mentioned Chuichi, I want to appreciate how he dealt with the whole Hazuki situation. I think it showed that at heart he's a sweet guy. Um, he let Hazuki down easy and didn't lead her on. And well, for her part, Hazuki was incredibly mature in how she dealt with her feelings not being reciprocated. And she moved on, you know, to try and do what's best or so she thinks for her friends. And it just kind of broke my heart 
you know, when she compared her supporting role as a tuba to her role in being like a kind of wingman for Kumiko. Um, the only thing that Shuichi did that irked me a little, not a lot, was when um, he misunderstood Kumiko as giving him like a look or a signal to meet her outside the rehearsal room. That was fine because people make mistakes, you know, and Kumiko was being a bit weird. However, when Kumiko tells him in no uncertain language that it wasn't a signal, he continues to insist that it was and never just backs off and says, oh, sorry, my bad. That was when I was like, Shuichi don't do that. You know, um, general life tip, if a girl or anyone really tells you that they didn't give you a sign or they're not interested in you, take it. Uh, you know, (laughs) Shuichi to his credit, didn't go about it in, you know, an asshole way. There is like a spectrum, a whole spectrum of, you know, just very mildly irritating to super inappropriate behavior when guys don't take a hint. And Shuichi definitely falls on like the very mild end. So not great, but he's still a nice guy who means well. But yeah, take the hint. Okay, before we get to the festival triangle episode, which spoiler, the real triangle was between Shuichi, Kumiko, and Reina. Um, a couple more notes of interest. Firstly, who was that mysterious girl that rejects Kumiko in that flashback? Secondly, I am loving this juicy love-hate relationship between Natsuki and Yuko. That part where Natsuki destroys Yuko just casually when Kaori rejects her, <laughs> her offer to go to the Agata festival, uh, that was brutal. But then later you see like Natsuki and Yuko end up having a great time together at the festival. Uh, so I think that's like a ride and die kind of relationship where you're able to tear each other down, but still make up enough to want to go out together. Um, I just love Natsuki in general. Her spilling the beans on Goto and Rico and Rico wanting to just dig a hole in the ground and hide uh, was priceless. Goto was so cool in that moment. He just like sipped on his water bottle like nothing was happening. And, you know, after these episodes, I have officially crowned Goto and Rico like best straight couple ever. Um, Asuka too, I mean, she didn't really react at first until, you know, because she's focused on her music, it's like that hyper focus, right? Until, you know, Rico tried to cover up the whole thing, which of course makes Asuka rise to the occasion and just stir the shit pot. Um, yeah, I'll say it every time. I just love this base family. On the more serious side of things, I really appreciated Natsuki's ability to reflect on past events, particularly uh, about the split, and admit where mistakes might have been made. So according to Natsuki, the first years who wanted to do well or take things seriously were ignored by everyone except Haruka and Kaori. And I love how like Sapphire and Hazuki were visibly outraged Uh, when they heard that, just once again proving themselves to be the pure-hearted babies that they are. Um, Natsuki also touched on like the objective versus subjective nature of music. So when talking about music competitions, she said like being shoved around uh, by such a vague evaluation uh, isn't how music is meant to be enjoyed. That's what the more indifferent senpais would have said. But in the end, it was just an excuse to avoid injuring the grueling practice. So there's that incisive reflection of Natsuki's that I really like. Um, Also, on that topic, you know, over the years, I've thought a lot about whether you can apply objective criteria to determine whether a piece of music or a performance of it is good or not. Um, You know, especially throughout like the process of getting my music performance diplomas and also more recently because sometimes this channel ventures into like musical analysis um and i think i've made peace with the fact that music is meant to be enjoyed both subjectively and objectively you know there is a clear difference between uh banging mindlessly away on the keyboard for example and something like a beethoven sonata you know objective musical principles and criteria help us separate those two 
and place all other music somewhere in between those extremes on a spectrum. Uh, It's also satisfying as an artist or a composer or a performer to know that you've achieved um, an objectively accessible standard or or to have one to work towards. Um, I know that as a performer myself, like I hated when people, though they meant well, uh, told me how great my playing was when I knew for a fact that it was far from the best that I could do uh, and that they weren't really applying any sort of uh, objective criteria when making that judgment and were just being nice. It's that thing. It's like, oh, you're nice. You know, nice is not uh, sufficient enough, um, you know, criteria to apply when you're talking about things like (laughs) uh, music or, you know, whether you're a good president or not. Anyway, uh, at the same time, though, you know, of equal importance, uh, and I really believe this, I'm not just, you know, saying it because it sounds nice, but of equal importance is your subjective enjoyment of whatever music you like, because it's a fact that people will gravitate towards different types of music and that too is perfectly valid. So I guess in answer to Natsuki's sort of like dilemma, you know, it's just, it's a weird mix of the objective and subjective when it comes to whether music is good or not. Okay, episode eight. Man, how are you guys still here? If you're still listening to this, (laughs) you guys are crazy. Um... But that's good because we're going to keep going um, and talk about episode eight, wherein we try to pass the love triangle of Kumiko, Reina, and Shuichi, or like, you know, technically a love square if you include Hazuki. Uh, and I want to start by thanking those of you who uh, warned me to not get my hopes up too much about Reina and Kimiko. Um, and even though you had nothing to worry about because I knew going into this that we would never get a canon queer relationship. Um, and in fact, I have been training my whole life to never harbor expectations of such a nature. <laughs> but thank you anyway. I think that was uh, really kind of you all. I'll start by bringing up two questions which I feel are the source of most of the spiciness and dare I say controversy of this episode. The first question is, um, knowing Reina and Kumiko are never confirmed to be a couple, did episode eight queer bait? Uh, And that is a question I will not answer today. Not because I can't, but because um, I'm tired (laughs) and I don't want to. Um, I will link probably to some articles written by far more qualified people who discuss what queer baiting is. And and so I'll, you know, in that way, I'll fulfill my queer duties. But to be honest, um, yeah, I I don't feel up to dealing with that in this particular forum. Um, And I'm sorry, but yeah. There's also just the inherent difficulty when discussing queer baiting in entertainment media where you can't exactly pin the hopes and dreams of the entire non-monolithic queer community for diverse and complex representation onto a single show. But at the same time, you know, when show after show after show after show after show fails to deliver the lack of canon queer relationships or baiting in a single show becomes part of a wider problem. That's why I'm always torn when it comes to queer coded media, of which Hibike is for sure. Um, Because in an ideal world, you know, we would be celebrating representations of all types of queer people and queer relationships, including non-romantic or ambiguous ones. Unfortunately, we are still contending with a media landscape, um, which has improved like markedly over the last two to three years, even in animated series, where we're often only ever given a stark choice between ambiguous queer coded relationships that are never confirmed in canon as romantic and thus 
always deniable or just horribly simplistic to no representation at all. There are some great interpretations of Rena and Kumiko's relationship in the comments, um, like Pencil Shark 333 who wrote, For Kumiko, I view her as being completely uninterested in romance and sexuality at this point. She shows no interest in Shuichi or the festival itself. Kumiko is obviously deeply interested in Reina, but in a similar way that the other band members think it's obvious that Kumiko and Shuichi are together, Kumiko's worldview right now just doesn't consider that at all. You know, the idea of either an aromantic or an asexual Kumiko uh, who is attracted to Reina in an intensely non-romantic way is like actually a great idea then something i could really get behind um joshua uh Kromoltz as well hang on where's your comment yeah so from joshua Kromoltz, um kamika and reina have something that goes beyond simply just being peers or even friends and as you can already see with the scene at Mount Daikichi that the both of them are self-aware that the other strokes their passion for music and even just like raw teenage emotion. So another not necessarily romantic reading, um, or you know, it could be a bit of a weird mix of both. Um, also, I really did enjoy your analysis of that mountain climbing scene uh, through queer lens, but that was fantastic. But I guess uh, the point I'm trying to make is that platonic non-romantic readings of Kumiko and Rainer's attraction to each other um, are perfectly valid. Uh, it's just that from my perspective as a queer person, because we're still wandering in this like huge dry desert that lacks complex, uh, explicitly romantic queer rep in an animated series or animated series, I can't help but root for a reading of their attraction as romantic or potentially romantic. Uh, particularly if, you know, say Kumiko and Reina were a straight couple, uh, I would bet my house on the fact that there would be far less need to defend even just the possibility of them being romantically attracted. Um, and I want to make clear that I am not a spokesperson for the queer community. Uh, you should never, ever... <laughs> Um, treat one person as the spokesperson. Uh, so obviously there's going to be many, many different opinions about this, just even within the queer community. Um, so yeah, just make sure you know that I'm just stating my own personal opinion. Now, it is precisely because of this bias of mine that I fully acknowledge that I went back and I rewatched this episode with the explicit goal of doing my utmost best to interpret the events and the dialogue in a way which would support a totally non-romantic reading to try and answer the second spicy question in as objective as a way a way as possible uh, which is is Kumiko and Reina's relationship platonic or not uh, and while I do not have an answer that is 100% certain simply because nothing has been made explicit, I can, with a 99% confidence interval, say that episode 8 rocketed Kumiko and Reina into non-platonic territory. Before I dive into why I, c I still concluded that, even after attempting as much as possible to scrub the queer from my queer colored glasses. Uh, I need to summarize like a neat little discussion between myself, Cookie and Temelge in the comments about definitions and what constitutes a platonic or non-platonic relationship. Um, so the word uh, platonic has a very storied history, but to make sure we're working off the same definition, uh, when I say platonic relationship, I'm using like the ordinary Merriam-Webster definition. Uh, so a platonic relationship is one that is characterized by a complete lack of romantic feelings. And so following from this definition, as soon as an element of romance or potential romance is introduced, the relationship in question immediately becomes non-platonic or potentially non-platonic. Um, because, you know, Cookie made a fantastic point, which I totally agree with, and that is that platonic love or relationships can be just as intense as um, romantic ones. And actually, the example I thought of is that 
people can and they do marry and raise kids platonically. Um, it is not outside of the realm of possibility. Uh, but, you know, the great thing with anime is that every single frame is meticulously planned and storyboarded to produce a certain effect. And having considered the context and the animation choices and also, you know, the confirmed straight one-sided ship of Hazuki and Shuichi that we can compare Reina and Kumiko to, plus insights into Naoko Yamada's intentions when she wrote this episode. Um, I was able to conclude that the most natural and reasonable interpretation of the Kumiko and Reina dynamic is a non-platonic or at least a potentially romantic one. Note that I said the most reasonable and not the only reasonable interpretation uh, because I fully support anyone who prefers to read Kumiko and Reina as being in an intense platonic relationship even though I personally think that the text supports an alternate reading more. Uh, Because God knows we also need um, in our media more representation of very purely platonic relationships that are also at the same time incredibly complex and nuanced. Um, So yeah, all power to those of you who do take that interpretation. So here we go. I considered Kumiko and Reina from three different aspects to gauge the nature of their evolving relationship. In terms of evidentiary strength from weakest to strongest, um, first and the weakest is like anecdotal evidence, you know, in other words, like real life girl experience. Uh, Second is like authorial intent. So Naoko Yamada's own words about what she was going for when she wrote episode eight. And lastly is the text itself and like the abundance of deliberate cues and setups that suggest elements of outright or potential romance. Um, So first is like the anecdotal evidence, which is me saying that I personally would never in a million years do the things and say the things that Reina does to Kumiko and vice versa if I wasn't romantically interested in the girl, especially that lip touch. Uh, and especially because like Raina, I don't approach people unless I'm interested in them in a serious way. Um, even my high school self, who was much less sure about my identity and how to deal with relationships, even that high school self would never, you know, nor would any of my girlfriends gay or straight. Um... (laughs) There is, however, you know, merit to the idea that Reina and Kumiko don't really know the boundaries between intense attraction and actual romantic attraction, being the high schoolers that they still are. Um, But that ambiguity only solidifies this intriguing development of their feelings for each other. Um, Because in real life also, romance often starts with that confusing, awkward stage of trying to figure out why you're so attracted to a particular person. Um, And here I also want to deal with something that I don't know why, but it always comes up when there are queer coded moments between two girls. Um, And it's almost always brought up by people who aren't queer and who aren't girls. Um, So (laughs) do girls like joke around and kiss and touch each other in flirty ways? Absolutely. However, it's also blindingly obvious to us when a joke is just a joke and when things turn ambiguous or step over the line into the serious. Um, And the progression of the dialogue between Kumiko and Reina, which we'll dig into later, and just the overall beauty of the settings and in the details of how the girls look at and touch each other, None of that supports the reading of just girls doing the girl thing where they flirt for fun or because they're really good friends. Instead, it was deliberately written to be a serious in like a serious interrogation of growing feelings between two girls who are only just beginning to get to know each other, whatever final form or shape those feelings will take. Still, you know, at the end of the day, anecdotal evidence is weak. 
you know, I will say something, someone else will say something different. You know, everyone has different personal experiences that can't be generalized, which is when we move on to authorial intent uh, or basically what the creator or the writer was thinking when they wrote this scene, um, which I retrieved from a very long and interesting interview with Naoko Yamada and Tatsuya Ishihara, um, which I did not read in full. So, but basically the short answer is yes, Yamada totally meant to inject serious romantic elements into the Kumiko and Reina dynamic. And I'm like, there's a lot of little nuggets of information in there, but I did read it with sort of like my eyes half closed because I was warned that there are potential spoilers. Um, luckily, like some of you very kindly directed me to like the relevant bits on Kumiko and Reina. Um, and wait, let me pull it up now, actually. Yeah, so the first excerpt is um, <laughs> the first excerpt is like Yamada sort of talking about how when writing the mountain scene, you know, she was going for like a first time falling in love experience. Uh, right, is that on there? Yep, yeah, this part. Uh, you know, they, there's this, like, funny part about how when they bring up, you know, the whole lip touch thing um, and Yamada kind of apologizes for bringing out this seductive atmosphere between both Kumiko and Reina. Um, but then, you know, this is the part that's really, like, revealing. So she basically says, like, you know, She's inspired late at night to work on the storyboards. And then she very much enjoyed that writing a love letter feeling it had. Kumiko gradually appeared to look like a young boy during the mountain scenes. I thought giving the feeling of a young boy falling in love one summer would be nice. It'd be a first for Kumiko, which is really sweet. Um, I don't think you can get any more direct than that. Um... I also kind of found it funny that the interviewer, who is a man, by the way, was like, oh, you mean like a first kiss? And then Yamada is like, no, I said what I said, like a first experience, you know, meaning like she was going for like a much deeper and complex attraction that is developing between Kumiko and Reina, which can't simply be reduced to you know, mere physical or like a superficial interaction. There's another fascinating part, you know, where Ishihara and Oguro, the interviewer, again, both men, you know, are joking about how Yamada, in the way that she treated Kumiko and Reina, wrote Yuri in a way that men wouldn't expect or want it to be written. And <laughs> Yamada is like, okay, let me say this clearly. I don't think it's depicted as Yuri. I wanted to depict adolescence. Um, and she kind of repeats herself. So, uh, where was that? Okay, this is all this part talking about, you know, what Yuri is and isn't and what men expect it to be. Um, and then here is Yamada being like, okay, I didn't write it as Yuri. I wrote it as something that depicts, you know, true to life adolescence. And the fact that she insists repeatedly that what she wrote for Reina and Kumiko isn't Yuri um, gives me great confidence actually in the strength of the non-platonic reading of the relationship. Um, you know, as we all know, like one of Yuri's defining traits is that it's either not serious or it's really rare for relationships between two girls to be complex, healthy, and or canon. So Yamada distancing herself from the Yuri label is actually really heartening. Um, and it really does align more with uh, what's happening between Kumiko and Reina as being uh, like what she said, just take her words, you know, take the hint. <laughs> like uh, It was meant to be kind of akin to the experience of falling in love for the first time. Finally, you know, even if you forget anecdotal evidence, forget authorial intent because, you know, death of the author and all of that, um, and look only at the actual text itself, it is still difficult to come away with a more reasonable reading than Kumiko and Reina are at the start of a romantic, complex, 
non-platonic relationship um whether or not it actually ends up you know coming to fruition is another complete different matter um and sort of the first huge flag indicating that we should be open to the idea of romantic attraction between Kumiko and Reina is what I call like the straight stick standard. <laughs> you know, we have a confirmed straight romantically linked couple in Shuichi and Hazuki, even though it was very much one-sided on Hazuki's part. Now recall like the grand total of two or like three signs we got prior to Hazuki's crush on Shuichi being confirmed in text. You know, it's like, like that brief look when Hazuki gets off the tram and runs into Shuichi by coincidence. Um, it's like the little blush Hazuki gets when she sneaks a glance at Shuichi, which by the way, like in that episode was followed by a shot of Reina watching Kumiko. <laughs> uh, there was actually another part during rehearsal when Shuichi is watching Kumiko write notes on her music and then he looks over to Reina who's also watching Kumiko. It's just all this weird like paralleling that's going on. Um, immediately you know our brains just like switch on to these universal high school romance tropes like and sure enough you know the story follows through on the straight couple after like a whopping two or three signs. Uh, so when in these eight episodes, uh, between Kumiko and Reina, we have gotten numerous looks and blushes, way more suggestive dialogue, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, and even like intimate physical touching that ventures beyond the stereotypical, uh, girls touch each other all the time trope. I'm satisfied to read those as signaling romantic interest um, because I will apply the straight stick standard. You know, I won't engage in mental gymnastics and use like one standard for the straight couple and another more insanely higher standard for the potential queer couple. Um, like if a text is using tropey romantic signs for the straight couple, I will assume that the same tropey romantic signs also apply to the queer couple. An offshoot of the straight stick standard is like the difference that is like night and day between how Kumiko responds to Shuichi and how she responds to Reina. I mean, Kumiko couldn't be more disinterested in Shuichi. The poor guy and I do kind of feel sorry for him at times in episode 8 he has to work really hard to get Kumiko's attention whereas Kumiko is always hyper aware of Reina's every move um she doesn't notice Shuichi at the train station because she's like busy practicing her fingering and then when Shuichi is practicing trombone next to the river with her and in all honesty sounds quite mediocre at it um, and kind of asks Kumiko what she thinks. Kumiko is like, eh, <laughs> he's just clearly thinking about other things. Um, in stark contrast to like the duet that she does with Kumiko, uh, with Reina at the end. Um, you know, when Shuichi asks Kumiko to practice together next time, she immediately says, nah, my youth's too heavy. And then just cut to Kumiko, you know, later, huffing and puffing, lugging her euphonium up that mountain just to play with Reina. Um, the contrast in the scene where Shuichi asked Kumiko out is really stark as well. There's like a great close-up of Shuichi's blush and just the light reflecting off of his trombone, um, to which Kumiko's like responds, you know, when he asks her out, he's like, huh? why <laughs> which I lolled big time at because so relatable um but compare that scene to like the vastly more rich colors of the the budget smile scene you know um you know and Kumiko's blushy speechlessness at Raina's words plus you know her replaying Raina's smile in her head and just her pure joy the little jump that she did when Raina goes off to walk home it's just it's so obvious that the Kumiko and Raina interactions are played up way more to be much more intense um and of course you know what's developing between Kumiko and Raina is fascinating outside of any reference to any straight stick standard you know it is an incredibly compelling attraction between two people 
whether it ends up being romantic or not. Though I would argue it is most reasonable to acknowledge like the potentiality of that. I would like to steal a fantastic summary from Chexabuse about what makes the Kumiko Reina relationship so captivating. Um, so from Kumiko's perspective, Reina is everything Kumiko aspires to gain from high school. A goal to aim for in life, a strong sense of purpose and self, incredibly self-confident, and Kumiko perceives her to be really mature. I believe Kumiko has a non-sexual crush on Reina, elevating her to a status that is not necessarily true, but she's so dazzled by the brilliance of Reina. She's drawn in totally and will utterly submit herself to Reina just to be with her. Notice that when Kumiko accidentally grabs Reina to go on a date to the festival, um, <laughs> Reina is willing to go along with it. But so is Kumiko, who didn't even attempt to say that she was just trying to get out of an awkward situation with Shuichi. Reina, on the other hand, is drawn to Kumiko, uh, to Kumiko's blunt honesty when voicing her opinions, albeit half the time subconsciously, and her terrible personality. They this part was really good. Like they live in a society where the facade of politeness and respect trumps everything, and to meet someone who breaks that mold intrigues Reina no end. She is not interested in clicks or the need to meet the social norms, as that would directly counter her dream to be special and apart from the rest. And we can end the video there. No, um, I do have a little bit to add, but that was really, really good. Uh, this idea of being special or different to others really is the crux of why Kumiko and Reina can't help but be drawn to each other. Um, when Kumiko is asked, like, who she'll be going to the festival with, her answer is like, oh, I don't really like crowds and there's nothing special about street stalls. Um, to which Natsuki makes, like, another sharp, very insightful observation, which is that Kumiko is kind of distant like that. Being distant is what Kumiko shares with Reina and Asuka to some extent. Um, for Reina, you know, she doesn't get close to people she's not interested in. It's it's all or nothing. Uh, if someone doesn't interest her, she will make zero effort. However, if someone catches her eye like Kumiko does, she'll tell them that she wants to peel their faces off. <laughs> there is no middle ground for Reina. You know, just like there is no middle ground for her pursuit of music, it's either be the best or be nothing at all. Um, and so when you watch the events of episode eight unfold through the lens of remembering just how rare it is for someone to catch Raina's eye and how incredibly difficult it is to pull Kumiko out of that indifference of hers, that's when you realize just how big a deal it is that these two are hyper aware of each, of each other all the time, that they would remain holding hands, you know, long after they could have let go and that they would go out of their way to hike up a mountain alone to enjoy each other's company and to play music together. It is cute how even though Kumiko and Reina are emotionally drawn to each other, that they're still trying to figure each other out. Like they don't quite have each other's measure yet. Um, for example, Kumiko has to ask Reina, uh, do you do this kind of thing often? To get confirmation that no, Reina is not the type to randomly hike up mountains in heels that are clearly not meant for hiking with someone uh, like this, you know, um, and then there's Kumiko's like continued fixation on how beautiful Reina is. She's enamored by how Reina insists on carrying her euphonium for her, you know, halfway up the mountain because of her sense of rightness and specificity about doing what she means to do. Um, and at various points, I was like, oh, Kumiko, please stop drooling. <laughs> Especially after Reina revealed that she's not adverse to pain, and Kumiko super dodgily says, oh, That's kind of hot. Um, in Japanese, it was like Nanka Edo, and I find it really hard to imagine uh, a scenario where <laughs> you would say that to a girl you have zero interest in. At least not said in that way, in that particular setting. Um, 
And Reina, for her part, you know, is drawn to Kumiko's terrible personality, as Taxabee's pointed out. You know, the fact that she has no filter, and in contrast to her good girl exterior, prefers to distance herself from others, um, and will just blurt out things without any uh, regard for the consequences. Um, And in some ways, you know, Kumiko is like the ultimate relationship or romantic challenge. To be able to attract someone as distant as Kumiko is, um, is a real achievement and weirdly fits Reina's extreme obsession with chasing after ambitious goals. That is why I think Reina's interest in Kumiko is expressed in these extreme ways, like from wanting to peel her skin off to announcing like a love confession. Um, Because for an extreme personality like Reina's, everything she does and says has to carry weight. Uh, Also, when Reina told Kumiko that hiking to see the view isn't the main goal, what's important is the fact of doing something very few people would do, we're reminded of Reina's drive to be the best for the sake of being different or superior. Um, And usually people who harbour this kind of ambition are used to flying solo, but it's also, it's got to be nice for Reina to finally meet someone whom she feels truly understands and accepts that part of her. Reina's like little dig at Kumiko about Shuichi was, um, (laughs) was funny and insightful too. So Kumiko's panic and then Reina's little like smile as she turns away was perfect. I loved how immediately after asking about Shuichi, Reina says, no one else would be crazy enough to hike up a mountain on festival day, right? And just given the sum of Shuichi and Kumiko's interactions compared to Kumiko and Reina's interactions, and given the context of Reina's Shuichi dig, I read that as you'd never settle for a normie like Shuichi, would you, Kumiko? You know, not when you have someone like me who's crazy and wants to rip your face off because I love you so much. And then Kumiko is like, yeah, I guess so. (laughs) It is just so entertaining watching these two dance around each other. Um, You know, we talk about how Reina is reaching for the stars and how she's not going to be one of those who just thinks they're special. Um, But Kumiko herself, especially after having interacted with Reina, also in some ways shares Reina's sense for what is special and what is not. Um, So rewind back to when Kumiko sat with Shuichi next to the river and they were talking about how much they think the band has improved. Shuichi is um, very optimistic about their chances, while Kumiko is more cautious and seems to have a better uh, internal sense of what it would actually take to be good or special enough to win, something that she shares with Reina. So in the moments leading up to the lip touch, Reina confirms that Kumiko understands how she feels about just swimming against the current when it comes to social relations and what people expect to be normal. She then proceeds to kind of strip away the remaining barriers between them, including interrupting Kumiko's like, calling her Korsaka-san and insisting that they drop the honorifics. And it was fascinating that the actual lip touch coincides with Reina reaffirming to Kumiko her wish to become someone special uh, through her skills as a trumpeter. Um, And so she's the one who wants to peel Kumiko's skin off, but here she's the one who's uncovering herself or in a way peeling her own skin off so to speak, uh, by revealing her deepest held desire. So this really intimate action of touching Kumiko's lips complements a really intimate reveal of the core of who she is and what drives her whole being. And that, I think, amongst many, many other reasons, is what made this moment so breathtaking. There was more great insight into the symbolism that's going on in the scene from Luke, who wrote, Kumiko says that Reina in her white dress brings to mind a Yuki Ona, or snow woman, a yokai often associated with leading people to their deaths. It is interesting that this is the second time Kumiko has followed her while thinking about being killed by her, though this time she seems okay with the thought. Uh, 
I loved learning about the Yuki Onna, um, the snow maiden who feeds on human life by sucking it from their mouth into hers. Uh, so the way that Raina's white dress was blowing in the wind in that lip touch scene really reinforced that that was really the moment Raina was going to suck the life out of Kamiko as the snow maiden. But as, you know, Luke mentioned, you know, Kumiko is absolutely captivated and thinks to herself, I really wouldn't mind losing my life tonight. Um, there is actually an additional significance to this, uh, which I learned from someone who has lived in Japan for many years. Uh, in a way, you know, Kumiko's thought is a response to Raina's previous confession of love. There is a a famous literary legend surrounding what it means when Japanese people say um, tsuki ga kirei desu ne, which translates into like the moon is beautiful, isn't it? And it's a phrase commonly understood to mean I love you, except se- said in a way that's not so brazen and direct. Uh, and the way for someone to respond to that, should they reciprocate the feelings, is to say um, shin de mo ii wa, or I can die happy. A rephrase of what Kumiko is thinking, you know, I wouldn't mind losing my life. And there is actually some really cool stuff you can read about how this was all born out of a mistranslation of the original poem that started all of this, but that now has just become one of those, um, you know, misconceptions that's taken on a cultural life of its own. But yeah, I just thought it was really, um, like... Again, just going back to Naoko Yamada's interview, she totally knew what she was writing. (laughs) Finally, uh, something else that warmed my heart was uh, what Hannah A noted, which is that at the start of episode eight, uh, Midori very passionately says, you know, all music begins with love. And then lo and behold, like the title of the duet that Kumiko and Reina play at the end is called The Place We Found Love. Um, (laughs) I also really loved like how accommodating Kumiko was to Raina's request to play that particular song. I mean, all it took was for Raina to say, I like it. And then Kumiko's like, well, all right then. <laughs> and even during the song, just they were so in tune with each other. And I don't mean just technically, I mean also emotionally. Like the way that they uh, looked at each other and blended their sounds together was actually very intimate. Um, when Kumiko was watching Raina, she also made an interesting subtle dynamic shift like there's a noticeable decrescendo in her playing or like a slight decrease in loudness on her part just like right at the end kind of mirroring how she's letting Raina take the lead on this in the same way that she let Raina draw her out to this mountain um and there ends my thesis on why Kumiko and Raina have at the very least an intense greatly riveting blossoming relationship that was written to strongly allow for a romantic reading amongst other possible readings. Okay guys, we're going to actually dig into the episodes now. So episode nine, I believe is the one where we will get to see everyone or at least all the main characters audition for their parts, which I'm incredibly anticipating and uh it's gonna be likely that things are gonna blow up in Raina's face because she doesn't really care about anything other than uh taking her rightful place as the main soloist in the trumpet section so uh if you guys are ready to sync this up let's do it in three two one play Oh, sad Shuichi. <laughs> I thought they were going to show us the lip touch again, but that would be too much. Man, it has been way too long since we listened to this OP. You know, 
The mystery of Reina's smile, I love that she has only really smiled in the presence of Kumiko, I believe. Haruka, uh, she is the best president. I feel like Haruka is one of those characters that only you love more and more the more you watch the episodes and rewatch them. Best straight couple, undisputed. Hi. Look at how proactive they all are now. It's a real 180 degree turn. <laughs> Yuko is still trying hard, still pushing out that door, that senpai door. Reina is still just playing by herself. <laughs> Sapphire. Oh, Midori focused episode. Okay. Maybe. Right, so all sound, no subtlety. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, but it definitely is, you know, Reina, I guess, pushing Kamiko to be better and better. She's such a dictator. No. No. But what does that have to do with Midori? It'll get out anyway. Just what band is. Oh, but why? <laughs> That's the indifference that we're talking about with Asuka. And it may rub people the wrong way. And I totally get it. But also I kind of relate to it a little bit. A lot. She'll just literally walk out. She's like, I have no time for my kids. Just sort yourselves out. I hate that Midori is blaming herself for something that's not even her fault. Um, yeah, it was. She kind of encouraged Azuki. <laughs> hmm. Saved her time. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> I love their friendship. She got it for her. Wasn't she going for the double bass? And she kept missing out on it. Ah, oh, Hazuki is honestly the best girl ever. Was I? <laughs> Could be because thinking. Oh, okay. And these girls, they just take everything on their own shoulders. Oh, she did do something selfish in a sense, but it wasn't wrong. <laughs> She's like, wait, why am I backing off him again when I'm not even interested? <laughs> Oh no. <sighs> Kumiko's gonna end up with Shuichi, isn't she? <laughs> oh no, sorry. <sighs> Whatever. That's fine. Hazuki is so strong, I love her. But uh, what's the deal? They didn't have to sit apart. <laughs> hmm, so she still has friends in concert band. Man, I can't wait till we get like the backstory of Kumiko's sister. So she's talking about Taki, yeah. Oh god. Kumiko's thinking about Shuichi and then Reina's thinking about Taki. So okay, I can kinda see where this is going. Maybe she's just doing that thing where, like, if you act happy, eventually you feel it. There's a lot of, with these characters, just a lot of the front that you put up in front of people to show people and then your true feelings. <laughs> What, that she changes? That's cute. I knew it. <laughs> hmm. It is Raina still, like, kind of pulling Kumiko along. 
I mean, Reyna would have been forging ahead anyway, but she's kind of latched on to Kamiko now. Who's that sad looking girl on the left? <laughs> Still practicing that same solo part. Oh, it's Cody. I like that mole on just under her eye. Hmm. <sighs> I really like how do you... Oh man. I feel like she's not very confident, probably because Rain is on the scene now. But she still wants to do her best. Oh, oh I thought it was her crying. <laughs> <laughs> As president, that's part of a job, you know. In the rain? Oh, God, that look of determination in Cody's eyes. She had the smile on her face, like she's very polite and she wants everyone to do her best, including Rena, but damn, that tension, you could just slice with a knife. <laughs> it's like Yui in k -On. Oh man, here we go. A sudden. Hey, that's like where she uh, first thought she'd get murdered by Raina. <laughs> it's a great place to practice. That's Asuka, yeah. yeah. Oh! This girl. She thought... She thought Natsuki didn't care enough, but she does. Is she gonna get a pep talk from Reyna?
Okay, so how many do they have to cut? Just a few of them. That would suck so bad. Like if they only had to cut five people. Ah, oh, tacky, just saying all the right things. Auditions are, auditions are so brutal, like... Sometimes it's not really about who deserves to be there, not everyone deserves to be there, but there's just not enough spots. <laughs> <laughs> I god she is so in tune with her instrument and her music oh my god string play yeah man I remember bleeding all over my violin when I first started <laughs> yeah it's one of the joys of string playing God, wouldn't it be a surprise if Aska messed up? I don't think she will, but... Hmm. Okay, she looks pretty happy. Yeah, I don't think she has a problem of overconfidence at all, Aska. Like, she knows, like, where she's at. Was oh, bit some tuning issues there, but <gasps> no, I really want Natsuki to make it. <sighs> <laughs> hmm, interesting question. That was good. I think she got the hardest part down. Like, just imagine Raina, like, <laughs> cheat cold, willing you to do well. Oh no, we don't get to hear the trumpets. Damn. Oh, I actually don't know. I'd assume Reina would get the solo part. But if she doesn't, she's going to be pissed. Oh, no. <laughs> No. Oh. Uh. Yeah. Shit.
If she is Kumiko gonna give up her part? Oh, okay, maybe they haven't sorted the solo parts yet. Oh. <gasps> oh, the drama. Drama in C's. I imagine, I mean, everyone knows Yuko loves Kaori and would probably commit murder for her so she's gonna be pissed and she's such a dramatic person she's gonna, probably gonna be able to turn the entire trumpet section against Reina unless they're already you know biased against her which they probably are because Reina just doesn't give a shit <laughs> about you know cultivating social presence Oh man, I was so sad about Natsuki though. Uh, she, she, you know what's so weird? When she was practicing out the back of the school, she sounded great. But then in the actual rehearsal, she was just all over the place. Like she wasn't in tune, just a bit shaky. Um, I don't know if there are any youth players. I'm pretty sure there are brass players. <laughs> you guys who watch this, there are brass players. I'd love to know like if you heard any significant differences in uh, Natsuki's morning practice and then her actual audition. I just felt like it was night and day, but I'm not sure because I'm not really familiar with brass. Oh, man. Okay, guys, how you going? Uh, we're going to start episode 10 now. Uh, all eyes on the trumpet section, particularly now that Reina has secured her solo part which i feel like she always knew was gonna be hers uh i don't know i feel so kaori will definitely accept it gracefully but it's the rest of the band and the trumpet section in particular that's probably gonna cause a ruckus and i don't think this solo part is gonna go easily to reina for political reasons you know not for technical or musical reasons but i don't know might be pleasantly surprised so uh let's Play this in three, two, one, go. Ugh, just barely holding it in, Cody. It's uh, when I think about orchestra, I don't know, it's just <laughs> watching this is triggering all of these memories about um, orchestra politics. I guess you get that with any human group <laughs> that exceeds more than a few people. Although I could say like with our string orchestra, it definitely was less dramatic because there was one or two people at the top of our string section, our violin section, who were miles ahead in terms of technical skill. Um, and so it was quite clear who would do the solo parts. We never had any of these like open auditions or anything. Um, and also it's strange because to get into orchestra, you had to audition but um, we kind of also had several orchestras, so like third strings, second strings, open strings. And so you'd get put in an orchestra, no matter what your skill set. It's just like what quality of orchestra you went into. So everyone got the chance to participate. Yeah, so this is a pretty, pretty brutal. Who is this girl? <gasps> no. Oh my god, that 
it's a crime against humanity. Oh god, she's in the same position that Reyna is in. Oh, you never touch another musician's instrument like that, or like, kick it. That's horrible. Ah, <sighs> Kumiko, man. Natsuki bouncing back surprisingly well. So she's not a toxic senpai, obviously. Oh, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe she's going to murder Kumiko. <laughs> That's why she wants to meet with her after school. <laughs> I don't think so. That sounds great. Man, I remember timing our pieces, <laughs> like, to a second. Hmm? For the instruments? Mofu! It's so cute in Japanese. Well, Natsuki doesn't look like the murdering type, but you never know. I was gonna say her smile. She's smiling way too much. <laughs> Cowdy, ugh, she's still doing her part as a section leader. <sighs> Don't cause any drama, please, Yuko. Raina's music. <laughs> just the French horns just gossiping away. Oh no, what are they spreading about Raina? That's fair, they're high school students, probably broke. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the worst thing you can say to someone who knows that they screwed up. Man, that's a short time. <sighs> oh, okay. Right, so she practiced hard, but she didn't practice, like, she's not technically good enough to the standard that they need for the competition. Oh, that's so sweet, the messages you write on the shoot music. God, that's key. <laughs> oh my god. 
<laughs> she really freaked the heck out of Kumiko, didn't she? <laughs> On purpose. <laughs> What is she saying? Like, Reina somehow bribed, like, Taki? Is she, like, from a rich family or something? <sighs> Man, you gotta admire, like, that kind of blind loyalty. But I really feel like it doesn't help Cody much. Why did that feel like that was straight out of a horror film? <laughs> like Yuko's one of those stalkers. <laughs> Yo, overnight practice. <laughs> Oh no, I just kind of just remembered Reina somehow knows Tucky. Hmm. <laughs> Gata is so tall. Oh god. Don't. Oh, no. No. So inappropriate. Okay. <laughs> what the heck? It's not something you need to disclose, to be honest. Okay, I mean, you didn't have to say that explicitly. Oh no, she's gonna s slap her. <gasps> she said that to Cody. Whoa. He always does that. He just lets the drama unfold. And then he's like, okay, everyone, show's over. <laughs> oh man I'm glad these two have each other oh okay <laughs> we will go and back and talk about that scene that was just man another Domino's effect scene. That was beautiful. What do you mean, Raina? Okay. <laughs> what do you mean, Raina? <laughs> oh. I 
I don't know, maybe it's weird translations. <laughs> That's why you like her, because of her terrible personality. Mm hmm. Yep, even when the whole world is gunning for you. It's just gonna dig your heels in. Man, it was interesting that Raina addressed that to Cowdy. Even though Cowdy was, you know, obviously not the one who was instigating things. Ah, oh, man, this is the worst part of being in a band. It's going to split the band again, isn't it? It's got to do something. You know what you could do is just have, like, open auditions, you know? Like, have Raina and Cowdy, like, play in front of the entire band. Hmm. Even though, like, they should never have to be forced to do that, but I feel Reina wouldn't back down from that kind of challenge. <laughs> I mean, she looks so invested <laughs> in Kamika's life. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Who's that? She's cute. Like the little fang tooth. Is it getting to him, like all these rumors about his unfairness, alleged unfairness? Mm. I love these base family meetings. <laughs> and Asuka again, conspicuously absent. Haruka is still doing a role. <laughs> Asuka's just like in her bunker, <laughs> just waiting for it to all blow over. <laughs> really? <laughs> I wonder why. Is it because she sees um, Kumiko as on par with her musically? <laughs> Raina. No. Okay. <laughs> Oh god. <laughs> god, she is so <laughs> so wrong but so right <laughs> in many ways. Hmm. 
Hmm. See, man, I love how Asuka just knows Kaori. Those three, Asuka, Kaori, Haruka, they're family. <laughs> She's VP when it's convenient for her. If I had to bet, that's her real feelings. <laughs> There's no way I could peel it off. Just learning things from Reina left and right, eh? <laughs> it's so intriguing how talking to Asuka is like going through the whole rigmarole. It's like an obstacle course, and then if you manage to survive a conversation with Asuka, You've done well. That's so interesting. She knows Asuka won't come down either way. So maybe she's like, I have to handle this discontent in the band as captain by myself. Interesting. Just like all these hidden messages underneath that very short exchange. Music can't lie. So he's going to make it. Please do open auditions. Oh, you go, Haruka. Just crack your whip. Doubt. <gasps> and she's sitting right next to Raina as well. Cardi is like, please don't speak on my behalf, but also I'm feeling bad. I just need time to work it out on my own. Hey, yeah, yeah. But that does that mean Raina has to retry again? Whoa, democracy. Oh, I don't know if I agree with having students decide who should have the solo parts. <laughs> Even though I love democracy, like I'm all for democracy, but yeah, I don't know in this context. Ooh. Oh god, I really want to skip to the next episode now, assuming that's when the re-audition happens. I have very mixed feelings about this, only because 
for one, I feel it's unfair for Reina to have to um, defend or redefend her rightly given solo part. Um, I don't think she'd have an issue um, standing in front of everyone and re-auditioning. I, actually, I think she'd relish the opportunity. But in terms of <laughs> as a principal, it's uh, it's unfair. I mean, it's not unfair. Like, it's just a hard situation no matter how you cut it because I understand why Taki is doing this. It's because the, you know, the bubbling discontent and the doubt and the rumors were just getting way out of hand. And so this is one way to shut everyone up. The other part that I really actually don't disagree agree with um am against is <laughs> this idea of having students vote for who should get the audition the solo parts after the second auditions that is just a recipe for <laughs> it's just a popularity contest at that point um unless you know the students surprise us and can somehow objectively like judge the second auditions um, yeah, it's just so weird. Like, Reyna would have to be indisputably the better soloist compared to Kaori for, um, her to win over the other students. Because if, you know, they're almost, it's often the case where two soloists are just like neck and neck and there's only, you know really minor differences between their technical and their musical prowess and so usually it's like it's usually a call from the top like the the conductor or like the music director but yeah to have people vote on it by a show of hands um as much as my democratic democracy loving self (laughs) uh likes the idea i really don't think it's a good one Um, Okay, quick thought spitfire round. Uh, I am sad about Natsuki um, and Hazuki uh, for them not passing their auditions. But can I just say how impressed I am with Natsuki's attitude in all of this? You know, she put the practice in. She didn't end up making it, but nonetheless really valued how Taki and the rest of the band has pulled her out of the sort of depressive hole that she was in and that is really like the most important thing in all of this that she was able to rediscover her love for playing the youth and for music um i am apprehensive about the next episodes coming because of this idea from tucky to have public re-auditions um you know, plus allow the students in the band to have a say in who performs better and thus who gets the solo parts. Um, in real life orchestras or bands, I think this would never happen. And obviously it's been constructed to like milk the drama. <laughs> but even then, I'm very uncomfortable with this development, even though I completely understand why it was a step that had to be taken. Um, you know, th- it was just... I actually, myself, (laughs) I was advocating when I was watching this episode for open auditions. Uh, But when you actually break it down into real life, like it's actually kind of unfair to the student who got the solo part in the first legitimate auditions. Um, Also, Kaori, like I said, sort of at the beginning of this video, Kaori is a super interesting character, you know, because she is genuinely a good person, um, is gracious in accepting defeat in the way that she's expected to, uh, and is genuinely a good team player, but also has this uh, fire within her uh, that makes it difficult for her to personally accept that she'd just lost the chance to get a solo part in a competition to a first year and that that was her shot and she lost it um you know everything that yuko did to stir up shit about reina having known taki previously and and like spreading rumors about how the auditions were rigged because of that were hugely unhelpful and you could tell that kaori was extremely uncomfortable about all of that and it actually just made the situation even more difficult 
than it already was. But also, Kaori is not about to say no to a second chance to prove that she deserves the solo part that she has been working her ass off to get. Again, which is totally fair, but also it's just one of those situations where no one wins or you do this and someone is, is suffers and you do this other thing and someone else suffers. That's just part of the whole difficulty of um, managing the feelings <laughs> of 50 or 60 different people. And so I love that Hibike is so good at depicting the very real struggles and conflicts that musicians have when it comes to, you know, balancing the needs of the band versus personal desires, as well as like the need to present a gracious front in public in this very competitive environment and sort of accepting the chips as they fall versus the very real personal struggles again of being um, really disappointed with yourself and hurt that you didn't get a part that you have practiced so hard for. Finally, Haruka, again, man, just showing how she is the badass that she has always been. And obviously the ordeal from last time with, you know, having it all out with Asuka and Aoi quitting the band and all that, and being reminded by Kaori that she is the reason why the band still exists, all of that has really increased her confidence um, visibly in her own ability to manage the difficult and, like, diverse personalities and conflicts in the band. It, it was really interesting that part where she's watching um, Asuka approach Kaori, you know, from the window. And it's like she realizes that she is alone at the top in this job. Asuka is not going to try to help her convince the band members in any way because she doesn't give a shit. And actually, it was really interesting that it was repeated several times in these two episodes that Asuka will just um shoot off somewhere and wait for the storm to blow over and she will not lift a finger to help people sort of calm the storm because she again it's like the whole like the only thing she wants to devote mental and space and time to is practicing her youth um so yeah i mean you take asuka as she is right like whether or not you like that she does that or you know, whether you kind of understand because she is just a very particular kind of personality. Um, It's up to you for interpretation. Um, So, yeah, uh, that's it for this Spitfire round, I think. Uh, I know it's a relatively short sum up to what I normally do, but I feel like I chewed your guys' ears off way too much already in the recap section. So (laughs) I'm going to rein it in here and look forward to hearing your thoughts about these episodes. Again, I just want to express my appreciation for the effort and the thought that you guys put into the comments that you, you know, write on these videos. Um, I've done these reactions now for almost two years, I think. And it just, it never ceases to amaze me, like how generous people are with their insights into these animes that I'm watching. Um, and even or especially if like you have opinions that differ to mine i always enjoy reading them because uh i just like being able to see the same thing from different perspectives um so yeah thank you guys so much and i'm gonna call it a night there uh i hope you guys have a great day Uh, I'm going to try and put out more anime reactions more regularly in the next few weeks. Uh, It's just been a struggle recently because of, you know, life things. Uh, But thank you so much for sticking around. And I really look forward to more future Hibike episodes.